offering a phony solution to a non-existent problem, which is guaranteeing people who don't have the economic um, the economic benefit to charge fifteen dollars an hour for their services. Mm -hmm. The economic benefit is probably more like five or six dollars an hour, but they're already being forced to pay them at nine dollars an hour, fifteen. So that's a problem. But so eventually, one of the, one of the consequences, yeah. pretty predictably, is that uh, entry level people who don't have a lot of skills aren't worth fifteen dollars an hour. So you're shutting them out of the marketplace. Yeah. I would like to go to one more totally Thank unrelated you. topic, which is. What is the libertarian solution to protecting the uh, environment, Tim? Yeah, I guess it's evolved over the years. Um, one example that came to mind recently, um, like regarding, um, specifically regarding like wildlife, um, lions and tigers and bears, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. In Africa, they've privatized the, the, um, um, the territories uh, where these animals roam, and they've been uh, sometimes privatized, sometimes under the uh, public sector control, but they started charging for things like um, prize hunting. Uh, and, and they've said the actual results, the actual results uh, have showed that because people were money, uh, paying money into the system to maintain this, they were actually able to pay personnel and, and to maintain a, a balance of wildlife there versus before it was just kind of like people coming in there and, and, and doing whatever they want. Um, and those not, are not the most successful governments um, or successful societies in the world. A lot of uh, unstable issues there. But regarding here, I mean, the environment in California, I keep thinking about um, drug policy reform. There's, there's going to be so much regulations um, and time spent on figuring out water control issues, land development issues, agricultural opportunities. Um, and unfortunately, it's being primarily handled by state um, and uh, other government agencies. We don't have too much say in that. So we're trying to weasel away, our way in there. Um, but protecting the environment uh, outside of privatizing, um, I can't think of any new novel. Well, you know, I, I mean, I look at it this way. The, the environment is something that every, uh, you know, a clean environment, clean air, clean water, uh, et cetera, are, you know, uh, uh, preservation of, of, uh, of species and so forth, those are things that are universal wants. There's nobody in the world, nobody in the country that wants to have dirty water. There are some people dirty who water. Like cats. They might. Speak for yourself. Yeah. Dirty water or dirty air. You know, people don't want that. And if all land, all resources were owned privately, nobody would pollute their own land. I mean, I grew up on a farm. We owned a lot of land. We made sure that there, for, for Self-interest reasons. We made sure that the uh, sloping hillside fields were, were uh, uh, contour planted, uh, used terraces, did whatever we could to prevent erosion of the precious topsoil so that the sediment wouldn't rush down into the ultimately into the Mississippi River in the Gulf of Mexico with all the uh, pesticides and so forth. We were very much interested in, in, in preservation of the productive value of the farmland. Private ownership means conservation. Private ownership means protection, protection of the environment. Where you have a problem with environmental degradation is where the tragedy of the commons comes in. Where does the tragedy of the commons come in? It comes in where resources are not uh, privately owned. The oceans are a good example. They're owned, you know, nobody owns the oceans. So you have overfishing, you have uh, pollution of the oceans. Uh, the, 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 uh, the phrase tragedy of the, of the commons comes from old, I think old England, medieval England, where you would have a town square, a meadow in, in the town square upon which people could graze their sheep or cattle. It's overgrazed. And everybody's interest was to graze as many sheep or cattle on that piece of land as, as they could possibly get away with, which meant that it got overgrazed. If the commons, if that land was owned privately, You'd rotate pastures. You would uh, only have as many cattle or, or sheep on the on the uh, pasture as the uh, uh, pasture could carry. You would not overgraze. That's the significance, and that's the beauty of private ownership as uh, as opposed to ownership as to tragedy of the commons. We see a tragedy of the commons as well uh, in the uh, uh, land that's owned by the National Forest Service, by the by the uh, by the national forests or the national wilderness areas. You have. Uh, forest fires that are horrendous because nobody is 
clearing out the timber. Nobody is harvesting the timber. It's allowed to grow into thickets and uh, you have fire suppression so that those thickets get even worse so that when you do have a fire, it's even worse than it would, you would have, have been otherwise. You have a fire storm. You have a fire storm, yeah. yeah. So private ownership and encouraging uh, people to be responsible for their own uh, private property is the best way to protect, protect the, uh, the environment. And the, also the best way to grant people access to the environment. And you, you look at the national parks and you think that their duty is to provide uh, access to citizenry to these beautiful places such as Yosemite. But what happens is the sociopaths, the, the radical environmentalists, uh, get into positions of power and start creating non-legislative rules that say that only 250 people a day can climb Half Dome, where the capacity at Half Dome is 10 times that amount. But somebody's just written that rule. So they, they rather than make these beautiful things available to people and accessible to people, they, they keep them to themselves, where in, in a commercial environment, um, the people, uh, the, the people who owned Yosemite Valley, as such as it is, would make sure that as it could be um, viewed and enjoyed by as many people as possible who would keep the quality of that viewership right at the perfect balance between number of people there and too many people there. So the, the market will protect those, those natural wonders that we love but can't see because you can't get a hotel room there or a campground because the radical environmentalists don't want you to much better than the system that we have now. I have a question um, regarding cannabis development, uh, legal or otherwise. For the longest time, places like the Emerald Triangle up north um, have been diverting water streams, polluting the environment, and basically only caring for their lots, right? Their growing um, operations uh, at the expense of others. And there's been a lot of contention there. They are, you they're mean, all you pretty... mean pol polluting down, downstream, downstream right, yeah. property? Right, yeah, things like right. that, right? Yeah. Um, and they weren't really willing to come to any kind of private compromise. What would you recommend for something like that? There you have, a, have two situations going on. They're growing, they're, they're, they're basically poachers. They're, they're not, they're growing, uh, they're, uh, crops on, in most cases, uh, land that they don't uh, actually own. Uh, public, cases, land, public land in many cases. cases. No, no, I, I know some people, potential clients in, up in there, the, that have giant private lots. There but but the, point, the point is, you, you have to have down. rules against downstream pollution, as well as rules or laws, if you will, against polluting air that floats over into your neighbor's air. Uh, you, you do have the issue of neighborhood effects. So you have to make sure that you as a matter of property rights, no one has the right to pollute their neighbor's property. And in if any, they do, to, to any extent, and if they do, the solution, court, the solution is them. a tort solution as opposed yeah. to as opposed to a regulatory solution. Sue the bastards. They, they're not going to do that because it, most of what they've been doing for the last four or five decades is illegal. Mm. Oh, right, they, but they, if you, they haven't had to, to pay system. for the assets right. that they're right. using, where is, which is why they're where, against legalization. Whereas if that forest was owned by somebody whose job was it to depend, make a yeah, profit it off of it. It depends on private property rights and private property right protections and protections against it being, uh, your private property rights being uh, violated by somebody upstream or downwind. And there's, an, there's another perspective on that. That's uh, uh, Ronald Henry Coase, uh, economist who spent his University of Chicago. As a law professor, right. Uh, he, he wrote some uh, academic papers in the 1930s that didn't really get much attention. So some 20 years later or so, he wrote a book titled The Firm, The Market, and the Law, in which he explains why big organizations exist, how they could be justified. But he also points out that many of these uh, uh, conflicts uh, could be kept, dealt with on a very regional basis. For example, if somebody's uh, uh, polluting the air with their production factory, Chirac is, uh, hot sauce or the like, it smells so bad, you deal with the neighborhood. Say, I will buy you an air purifier that will remove these contaminants and so the air circulating in your home will be purified and clean enough to breathe. Or 
I could buy out your property for a, a reasonable price or pay you periodically for the, the inconvenience it causes you of having this smell in your in your backyard and the like. And, and that in other words, pay for the right to pollute. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and Which it doesn't have to be one size fits all. That fits that the model with a quote unquote cap and trade. People are yeah. paying for the right to pollute. Yeah, and, and, and that's a system that, that can work if it's if it's if it's set up properly. Yeah. Mm. Well, not not yeah. the way. It's not the way it is. Maybe paying up, no. premium to go to restaurants and being able to smoke indoors in a partition section. Mm. Yeah, that like that. that would be yeah, something right. desirable. Yeah. But incidentally, Richard, I believe that uh, we have a continuum as far as our content and programming here. Uh, we will continue on until probably the show ends at 8.30. Yeah, yeah that's right. So you got the message. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the, uh, you know, being on live at this point, we are uh, a week away from a, uh, uh, an election uh, in which uh, at the national level we have uh, a, uh, a clown and a crook, probably one or the other, going to be elected. Which one's which? President, no, well, no. you take your choice. Well, you, a president clown, you of, the, of the United States. Clown. And we have... Clown. <laughs> and we have uh, a libertarian candidate who is a very fine candidate, Gary Johnson. Oh yeah, uh, along uh, with Bill Weld, running, 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 running as a, as as a libertarian. We have an entrenched two-party system. It's been extremely difficult. I've been trying to get libertarians on the stage ever since 1971. I haven't succeeded yet. Is there any hope? Is there any way that we can overcome? Uh, Duverger's law, something that I, uh, I learned from Tim, I didn't know it existed before, which is that plurality elections lead to a propensity for a two-party system as opposed to a multi-party system. Is there any way of getting around that? Is there a realistic path for a more effective libertarian voice in politics? Yeah, first of all, you've got to uh, deregulate or change the regulations we have on the books right now. Um, the, 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 I don't understand how People, like in California, keep putting so much pressure on voting in popular elections for president when, in fact, it's, it's, a, it's been known for quite some time that the popular elections don't mean anything. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't actually choose anyone. Um, but we have a... How, how do you mean that? In the terms of this electoral college? Or? Electoral college, okay. yeah. yeah. Like, and they say, oh, who are you going to vote for, Tim, in California? And I said, oh, I'm probably going to vote for the libertarian candidate. And they're like, wow, that's a wasted vote. I'm like, but is it, though? If it, me choosing anything, is it going to matter on the state level? One of the issues um, is that we have multiple parties, right? And the Green Party and the Libertarian Party have been getting a lot more um, airtime, um, a lot more presence because of how ridiculous the two main parties have become, right? So if when we reach this climatic point, some people want it to be like violent and revolutionary. Some people want it to be peaceful, such as myself. Um, the, the, the people are already realizing that you can't just throw your lot behind, you know, bad candidate number one, bad candidate number two, that there is, there are mechanisms that allow for localized state elections for these officials, and then over time, um, like taking over central committees, things like that, those kinds of uh, localized strategies, over time, they realize that there are different options that you can go for. But the, the, the main issue is that the regulations of the establishment prevent things on the national scale. So that's something we have to look at. Um, so you're talking about a bottom-up approach? Yeah, that's one of the ways to do it. Um, I know libertarians in places like Washington State have tried for a long time to, to put a lot of candidates in local office. And for you know, some reason, or in some places they've been successful, others not so much. Um, I personally don't believe Gary Johnson is the perfect libertarian candidate. There is no or perfect is. candidate. No. Right. Um, I, I have other preferences. I would... Uh, if Rand Paul was still running, I think he would have an amazing uh, if chance Paul against... If Rand Paul was running, uh, he'd be running as, yeah, a, as yeah. a Republican. But yeah, but yeah right. I agree. Um, he, I think he would be he a would great Republican rip candidate. Hillary to shreds. But uh, that's that's not what's happening because the establishment has spoken. They don't want somebody like that. Um, Ron Paul was relegated to a House Representative's role. So Senate. Senate. No. U.S. Senate. Rand Paul's in the Senate. No, no. Ron Paul. Oh, Ron, 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 Ron Paul's out right. now. Yeah, and Rand Paul got, became a senator. Yeah. Good for him, good for him. Yeah. Um, but Duverger's law is just a social construct. It's a fabrication that we've created that for some reason is within the public school system, like every college level introductory course in politics. Uh, one of the areas they begin with is this. It's like, sorry, you're in America. We hate to burst your bubble, but you only have two choices. Yes, but, they, but they those get... two choices are actually one choice. 
Right. It's and, not, and that, these days, yeah. it's pretty much uh, there is two no sides difference. of the same. There is no difference between the two parties. Now, there, there are different sounding boards. My daughter will be very upset with me because her litmus test issue is, uh, is uh, are you pro-choice or are you pro-life? And, and mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's what determines her vote. Um, and the nice thing about, you know, uh, um, being in this country is she gets to determine what determines her vote. And I don't get to make up her mind. But um, the, the problem is that on every other issue, every single other issue, other than that one divisive issue, which puts 42% of the population instantly in the camp of one side or the other, is that the parties are the same. They uh, believe in, in government control, they, they believe in military, they believe in economic control, they believe in crony socialism. So there's only one party, but there is the appearance of two parties. Like this election is, is not about anything substantive because there are no substantive differences between these two parties. They're the Republicans or the Blamocrats. Yeah. It's the same party. My yeah. reading of uh, Duverger's Law for Dummies, which is where I had to start out, uh, offered some potential options or mm -hmm. uh, what might happen in a different country. Where there Parliamentary. Is pro pro proportional representation. Mm -hmm. right. If a particular party gets 15% of the vote, then they get 15% of the people in what is the House of Commons, say, for Yeah, example. I mean, and you have variations on that theme in yeah. various Western European countries, mm -hmm. but I don't notice that Western European countries are functioning a whole heck of a lot better than the U.S. is. No, it's really no. functioning all that well. <laughs> so, I, you know, so I think the problem comes down to the problem, you know, the inherent problem of democracy, which is that the majority gets to dictate to the minority. That is uh, a problem problem that you can't get away from in a pure democracy. The founders of this country had the foresight to realize that was a problem. That's why they created a republic with huge uh, institutional checks and balances on what the uh, democracy, what the majority could get by with. Which are and, being overcome and, and, and ignored they're, by and the sociopaths. Being, and they're being ignored to yes. a large extent by, by the politicians and by the court system in this country, which is one of the big problems. It also leads to a problem in, in terms of uh, the regulatory state. Now, we have a, a country where at the federal level, I, I took some notes, at the federal level we have uh, 4,500 uh, federal criminal statutes. 4,500, but that's not very many compared to the over 300,000 uh, federal criminal regulations. Because what we do is we have a Congress and an executive that will pass a law that says do a good thing, uh, but appoints a regulatory agency right. to define through rules and regulations Specifics. how yeah. that good thing can be accomplished. As a result, you have uh, the... Uh, uh, Clean Water Act, for just as one example, where if you do something that the Clean Water Act consider, con considers to be polluting, you don't have to have criminal intent in order to be found guilty. If you murder somebody to be found guilty of murder, there has to be criminal intent. Uh, and that's true with most ordinarily understood criminal law. With regulatory law, no criminal intent, intent uh, in many cases, or knowledge that what you're doing is wrong is needed. Uh, I, you this know, is what gives value to organizations. Let me just like Pacific just, Legal Foundation. They, yeah, they, yeah. They, they do wonders in protecting us from government. We we try. <laughs> Uh, just, I, I, I took notes, so I'm going to read my notes on, on a couple of the <laughs> uh, a couple of the examples. Oh, God. Skylar Capo uh, was a uh, a little girl that nursed a woodpecker back to life. She was uh, what a fool. Arrest, arrested under the migratory bird law. Back they, to life. Back to life. Nursed a woodpecker from, 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 from the, death. The state of yeah, death. Well, no. Because of the migratory bird law, she was uh, uh, aiding and abetting a bird and was found guilty of a federal law. O.C. Mills, was a, this is a, a PLF case at one point, O.C. Mills pr decided he wanted to build a house near a, near a lake or a river, and he poured foundation sand uh, in, in preparation. Sand? Sand oh. in preparation for putting in the, the foundation for the house. He was 
uh, sentenced to 21 months in prison no. uh, as an EPA wetlands violation. But hold on, he he wetlands. he did not violate any local. He, he no, he got he, the, he was permitted locally. All the local permits. That but he, the EPA that said, you didn't get a permit from us. You poured sand where we think it's a wetland. You are therefore guilty of wetlands violations, 21 months, throw away the key. Anthony Brassfield uh, was a uh, guy that he, he his, his big crime was he was in love. And since he was in love, he decided to fill a bunch <laughs> of balloons up, heart-shaped balloons, and release them into the atmosphere. Beautiful. He faced, I don't think he actually had to serve it, but he faced five years in prison because those balloons could have possibly landed in a nearby wildlife refuge. Uh, Eddie Leroy, in fact, Eddie Leroy Anderson was uh, searching for arrowheads on federal land with his son. He was a, a science teacher, searching for arrowheads on federal land. They didn't actually find any. But somebody found out that they were looking, and they faced a $1,500 uh, fine. And did not know he was on federal land. Didn't know he was on federal land. Bobby Unser, the racer, the car, yes. the car racer, was out snowmobiling, uh, out, you know, where there was snow. He got lost in a blizzard, and he had to uh, walk back to uh, civilization. Went back a few weeks later, uh, you know, maybe in the spring, I'm not sure. Went back later with the help of uh, Forest Service people trying to find his snowmobile. But they weren't actually trying to find the snowmobile. They were actually trying to find him guilty of trespassing on federal uh, uh, property, which uh, was a, uh, was a federal right. crime. federal land? Doesn't that mean we the people own that land? No, 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 Only no, with no, permission. No. Not anymore. Nancy Black uh, was fined or was, faced fines of $12,500 for feeding orcas, she was a wilderness uh, photographer trying to uh, trying to uh, you know take some 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 footage uh, and for feeding orcas. Orcas, faced, faced, killer whales, well, killer whales, right? How do you feed them? Uh, and here's here's the the, the, the piece de resistance. Like Three-year-old Dylan Warden, three-year-old Dylan Warden, faced well his parents faced two thousand five hundred dollars in fines because Dylan peed on the front lawn. Uh oh. Yeah. Gosh, I better talk to the family. Now, point yeah. is, we have a proliferation of regulations that makes everybody a potential felon. In fact, uh, Harvey Silverglade wrote a book called Three Felonies a Day. I, I think he meant actually three uh, violations, violations of criminal code yeah, a day. Yeah. But nevertheless, uh, three laws broken or rules and regulations broken. Is there any way other than litigation, which is what the, John, the organization that John and I do or work for, yeah. is there any way of getting Congress to uh, back off on uh, throwing more agencies at us with more and more regulations? No. There, no, there, sorry. There, there, Long there, discussion there may here. be hope for the future. But under the current circumstances, no. In fact, uh, what, what, what did we get foisted on us within the past eight years or so? What are they called? Affordable Care Act? Mm. <laughs> Joined with, with what kind of promises? If you want to keep your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you mm. want to keep your health insurance yeah. plan, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Well, it's the whole idea tax. the whole idea of health insurance is a misnomer. Yeah. We get insurance for catastrophic things. We get yeah. insurance, car sure. insurance, wreck. for a car wreck. We don't get insurance for gasoline or a flat tire. Why should we get insurance for a flu shot or uh, penicillin for a common cold or uh, antihistamine or whatever it is you take for a common cold? <laughs> or even, you know, green stick fracture. Yeah, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. Without an over-regulated -re medical there are industry, costs would be low. Ordinary Medicare should not be insured. The fact that it is insured adds a layer of bureaucracy in the doctor's office, a, bureau of, uh, a layer of bureaucracy at the insurance company. Uh, a bureau of rec or a layer of a regulator uh, of bureaucracy in the, in the regulatory agencies that regulate health insurance that probably triples or, or quadruples the price of actual medical care. And we don't know what we're paying for it because well, it's insured. Don't forget about lawsuits um, and this yes. predisposition in our culture to just sue the hell out of anyone for anything. So doctors um, in health institutions, companies, especially private ones, are scared because of these potential lawsuits, so they make sure over -prescribed that... Over-prescribed yeah, and over-medicated. Yeah, 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 So yeah. that drives the cost up, too. There's all of these... Uh, uh, also adds the, the, the cost of medical malpractice insurance, which is passed on to the consumer yeah. 
uh, through higher insurance premiums. There so, was ultimately, yeah. There yeah. was a study done by the Rand Corporation mm -hmm. uh, from 1971 to 1982 mm -hmm. titled The Health Insurance Experiment. They took groups of people, pretty well matched as best they could, and gave groups various types of coverage. One was totally free. They never had to pay anything. And then the others had uh, various uh, degrees of co-payment or personal uh, liability or the like. They found that there was no difference in health outcomes, no matter whether people had it free or whether they paid something. Um, however, the people that got it free tended to over-utilize hospital-based services by about 30 percent and outpatient doctor office and clinic visits by 60 some percent, which meant clearly it was inclus increasing the real cost, right. not the cost of that patient or family, but uh, making things expensive for everybody else. Mm. Were there any follow-up studies? Because uh, so much has changed in terms of like the medical technology and the expertise and yeah, the costs associated. Yeah, and there's, there's potential for doing things better, but uh, uh, one thing I do recall reading is that people did not change their personal behavior. The biggest determinant of what I call health, health care is personal care. Medical care is when your ability to maintain your health because of an injury or some kind of disease breaks down your system and you have to go to an expert to get care. That's medical, what I call medical care. Health care has to do with good living habits. Good nutrition. Eat right, exercise right, and get a lot of sleep. Exactly. Uh, not a fan. That's right. And find, if we can, find a uh, reasonably uh, stress-free uh, employment or environment. That's getting harder and harder to oh, do, yeah. isn't it? Oh, yeah. I, like for, I, for one, get very little sleep. Uh, I definitely don't have really good health practices, and uh, I overwork myself, which gives me a sense of satisfaction in the... Well, that, value, sense, so. that sense of satisfaction balances those other things. Without the satisfaction, like so. you, should, you would might do the other thing. And I tell my doctor, I pay you to help fix these little things, <laughs> not to keep criticizing me on X, Y, and Z. What about what about the uh, the entrepreneurial uh, part of uh, business? Oh do we? boy, let's talk about that. Uh, the regular two. That's one of the reasons why. Let's maybe combine it with with kind of a two part thing. The the. Um, Regulatory environment favors uh. large companies that can pay the regulatory cost and crushes smaller companies who are, who are uh, overburdened by the cost of regulation and the energy while still trying to run a business. Thanks for putting it in, in, into a nutshell. We're out of time. We'll see you wow. again next week, same time, same place on the Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you for being part of the show. Well, thank you.